Great, thanks very much. Um, yes, we're both coming up. We're going to do a, a little double act here for you. Uh, my name's Andy Howard, for those of you who don't know me, and this is Christina Kravich. Uh, I'm a man and a dog operation, and Christina works for York Archaeology. So we've been working, well, for probably about 20 years together on geoarchaeological archives, and we thought we'd just come and share some of our experiences today um, regarding... Um, you know, moving forward with, with those sorts of projects. I'll start off with the first few slides and then Christina will, will end with some concluding thoughts and, uh, and talk about a legacy project she's been looking at with uh, Historic England. Aha, uh, uh -huh. right way round. Okay, well, um, really, I think, you know, from a geoarchaeological perspective, perspective and thinking about geoarch archives, there are two main uh, approaches to dealing with geoarchaeology and sites. And the first approach is, is the one most archaeologists are familiar with, which is that basically um, the sites are not particularly complex and the work is done as part of a, a typical standard archaeological evaluation. So we have some trenches. Um, the recording is fairly simple. It's done on site by the site archaeologists with, you know, production of um, using pro forma sheets and pr production of, um, you know, section drawings. Um, the specialists may not come out to site, but they may advise over, over the phone or, you know, discussions in the office at night um, on, on where the best locality to take samples is. And that's how, the, you know, a standard sort of evaluation process works. Now, obviously, where there's much more complexity, this is where the, the challenges come from an archive perspective. Because with complex sites, things like deglacial landscapes there or alluvial landscapes, um, there's a much greater complexity to how the archaeological record um, fits in with landscape evolution. Um, and there are all sorts of issues of visibility and archaeological prospection. But the key point is, is often within units, um, you know, perhaps a specialist team will take over that work and come in and design it from a, a very early stage and take it through in the fieldwork stage, take it through in, in, in the, um, you know, sort of post field evaluation stage. Um, so there's much complexity to those records. Now, with a, with a, a typical standard, um, less complex site, um, you know, all that archive often is just incorporated as part of the site report. But once you start dealing with these um, very complex sites and the specialist teams coming in, then there's, there's much um, more complexity to the records. And, you know, for example, you know, we might be sampling on site, we may be getting a load of geotechnical records, a load of site samples, sediment samples. Um, we may be producing very simple stratigraphic diagrams, or we may be doing some deposit modeling to produce much more complex um, site archives and site narratives. We may have dating involved, we may have geophysics involved. Um, we may have taken some environmental samples and therefore, you know, we're, we're dealing with a range of specialists looking at plant macro remains, insects, pollen, and all these different data sets are being pulled together by the specialist teams, and they don't necessarily, you know, make it through into a traditional sort of site narrative as the raw data, because remember, all these different techniques have data sets behind them, and it's thinking about how we move forward in terms of um, those complex archives. So I shall hand over to Chris, who's going to talk a bit about legacy. So... Andy sort of explained the complexity of, of involving specialists, geoarchaeologists, paleoenvironmental scientists, your archaeological projects. Um, and as part of that, and as part of working with the Trent Valley Geoarchaeology Group, um, we came up with a project which was funded um, by Historic England to take carry out an audit of basically any contracting units that had worked in the Trent Valley the last 30, 40 years, to see what data they sort of were unofficially curating in their own archives. Because as Andy said, some of this data doesn't make it into the Grey Literature Report, it doesn't make it into standard archives. Um, so it was just an opportunity to see, are we repeating work? Are we using the, the limited resources that we all have in our best way? Can there be better ways of using that money? Um, and one of the interesting things that, that's come out of this audit, basically, is the low number of instances where projects have gone beyond post-excavation assessment and into final reporting and publication. Um, it wasn't really a surprise to me, because a previous paper I've given at CIFA at Brighton, 
um, where myself and Ben Geary did a review of all of the work that Birmingham Archaeo Environmental carried out. We looked at our own um, recommendations in post-excavation assessment reports and again we're quite surprised about how in the instances where final reporting and publication was recommended the actual low number of instances where those recommendations were actually taken forward um, and this is particularly relevant in terms of those long-running um, aggregate extraction sites um, where sometimes post-excavation assessment doesn't happen for a number of years and by then it's probably too late because your sample that you beautifully extracted from the site has turned into a little brick. Um, so that project really was to try and see if there's, there's more of that data that units have and hold and how can we extract that and, and disseminate that more widely. Um, other sort of data sources that, that you might have and, and again, don't make it into the traditional site archive, sort of client borehole reports, um, other unofficially published stuff or, or personal recollections of samples that you may have taken 30 years ago. You know, all of those data sources are really important, but you won't get those in a traditional archive. And so we just were coming up with some thoughts to try and sort of distill some of the things from, from the data audit project, from our own experiences, from working both within units, um, within university-based units, but also um, myself now working for York Archaeology and York Archaeological Trust. You know, we have an extraordinarily large archive and long-running projects that we basically can't easily data mine. Um, so there's this question really of the selection and, and long-term storage of those paleo-environmental samples. We know museums can't really take waterlogged material. All of the guidance that we currently have basically says, oh, waterlogged material, shh, uh, and then we just don't look directly at it and then we don't have to deal with it um but maybe we do need to deal with it because it's a finite resource you know with climate change burial environments are changing what once was ubiquitous paleo environmental data is actually at risk so those resources now are starting to look like actually the preservation was better 30 years ago than it is right now and we're losing it so we do need to think about it but how we do that do we need a national repository and and how would that work um there's also this lack of a unified technical standards across things like paleoenvironmental science and geoarchaeology. Um, and that's just a function of the fact that it's the multidisciplinary um, approaches that you take in those, in those spheres. There is no one way of doing it correctly because everybody's slightly different. We are all beautiful snowflakes. Um, but again, how would you enforce that? Um, and, and is it possible? There's data ownership issues, you know, particularly with deposit modeling. We're using data from a variety of sources, some of which we don't own. And again, how do we get around those copyright issues to make sure that that data is able to be disseminated and used by other people? One of the good things about deposit modelling, despite the fact that the need for this specialist software, is the underpinning data is stored in, in an Excel spreadsheet. So that's pretty ubiquitous. We can all probably access that. You might not be able to make the fancy 3D model, but the data that underpins it is still there and it can be reused. And at the very coarsest point, you can draw it out on a piece of paper. So in some ways, that's really great. But in other ways, you're not going to get a beautiful 3D model unless you're paying thousands for some software. So again, that's another issue. Um, legacy, I mean, this, this we talk about legacy. That was a great talk about legacy. I just was like, ah, quarry, quarry archives. Um, there's so much data buried in those legacy archives there is no money to do anything with them. And that's just a fact. And I think we probably all need to just say that. And I think once we start accepting there's no money to do anything with them, can we think creatively about how we at least extract something? You know, we are not going to publish a beautiful monograph on every single aggregate extraction site that ran out of money 25 years ago. But what can we do? And let's be like pragmatic. I love that talk as well. Pragmatic. We need to be pragmatic about commercial archives, especially the ones that have no funding. Um, and I think current projects, the projects we're undertaking now, really need to think about how they spend the money for that specialist work and how the resources get allocated so we get the most out of it and, our, you know, the most out of our limited budgets. So they're just some of the points that we've been kicking around and hopefully we can share them in the discussion later. Thank you. Mm -hmm.